She was just minutes from her front door, but she would never make it inside. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Tracy Ann Patient. Viewer discretion is advised. Tracy was born on February 20th, 1962 in England. A few years or so before this case, her family would move from England to the Auckland, New Zealand area. Tracy was described as a really fun girl. She was funny, energetic, and she just loved to make people laugh. She had two sisters. Uh, her older sister was about two years older than her. Her name was Debbie. Um, and then she had a younger sister, a couple years younger. Her name was Denise. Tracy got along wonderfully with both of them, but her sister Debbie was basically her best friend. They got along the best. But the three sisters, they loved hanging out with each other. They had a little group of friends that they really enjoyed spending time with. They would always have their friends over for sleepovers, or they would go to their friends for sleepovers. They would frequent, like, the ice cream bar down the road all the time. They would go to the movies. They would catch the bus and to go to the city and walk around and just hang out. This is also taking place in the 70s. And you have to remember that in the 60s and the 70s and even the 80s, kids would go out on their own, um, you know, and it wasn't as, like, problematic as it is, say, today, where parents are more cautious about having their kids go walking to places like, you know, the city on their own. On January 29th, 1976, Tracy's sister Debbie uh, was like basically begging her mom if she could go to this concert that was going on. And it was a concert from the Doobie Brothers, a very popular international band um, from back then. The concert was at a place called Western Springs, um, and the mom eventually said, yes, that's fine. Um, but then Tracy got a little jealous. She's like, well, if she gets to do something fun, can I at least go over to my friend's house tonight and hang out? And the mom said, yes, you can do that. It's fine. You all should have fun. And her mother saying yes just put a huge smile on Tracy's face. Um, and unfortunately, it would be the last time that Tracy's mom would ever see that smile. Just a little bit later that evening, uh, Tracy and Debbie would leave the house. They would say goodbye to their mother um, and they would begin walking up the street. And they were both going the same direction, but at one point they were going to split apart because where Debbie needed to go to meet her friends for the concert was different from where uh, Tracy was going to her friend's house, which was literally just a few blocks from where they lived. And this was a walk that Tracy made all the time, you know, she was very familiar with it. She always got to where she needed to go. Nothing unusual for her. When it was time for them to split up, uh, Tracy kind of fell behind uh, Debbie and Tracy said, okay, bye. And uh, Debbie said that she just sort of waved and said, okay, bye, see you later. Um, she never like turned around to say goodbye to her sister and Obviously, you know, hindsight is, is, is twenty twenty, but she, she says now that she regrets not turning around to look at her sister to say bye um, because she would never see her sister alive again. Um, you know, like I said, it's, she didn't know what was going to happen, um, but still she has that like that, that regret kind of built up inside. Several hours later, uh, around 9.30 p.m., uh, Tracy would give a call to her house um, from her friend's house that says that um, mm -hmm. me and my friend are leaving uh, the house right now and she's going to walk me about halfway and I'll be home in, in just a little bit. And this was a walk that probably should have taken maybe 20-ish, 25 minutes or so, if that. But unfortunately, when Tracy said she would be home shortly, shortly would never come. Like I was saying a little bit earlier, again, this is super common back then for kids to walk home by themselves, even at night. Um, in fact, it's stories like this, which is the reason why nowadays parents are more hesitant to let their kids do these sorts of things. 
it's stories like this one why parents have a much tighter leash on their kids and understandably so of course but back then they didn't really know this wasn't a common issue but anyway i digress sorry <laughs> by 10 p.m tracy does not arrive home and her parents are understandably very concerned this is something that has never happened tracy's never been late when she said she was going to be home in just 20 25 minutes so at this around the same time uh debbie had gotten home from her concert and she had said well i haven't seen or heard from tracy since we split apart when we were walking you know earlier this evening um so some red flags shot up so, so debbie and her dad they got into the family's vehicle and they began to drive around the neighborhood. They drove around where Tracy's friend lived. They walked and they, you know, knocked on her door, said, yeah, Tracy, they left. And then her friend was already back home. Um, they drove around the neighborhood. They drove around the city. They looked everywhere for her while the mom stayed at home with the other sisters so that she could make phone calls around to people, you know, Tracy's friends, acquaintances, other family members. Um, and also if Tracy were to come home, she wanted to make sure someone was there. About an hour after this, sometime around 11 o'clock, uh, the father and Debbie get home, no luck. The mom gets no luck with the phone calls. Tracy still hasn't shown up. So they go to police, they report that Tracy is missing. Running away is something Tracy had never done before. Um, and not to mention that if she were to have somehow run away, she brought absolutely nothing with her. Um, and it, it was just something that her parents, they, they, they knew deep down that Tracy didn't just run away suddenly. Um, they knew their daughter. They knew something was wrong. Something must have happened to Tracy and that's why she didn't come home. The next morning, um, the dad woke up kind of early. He kind of went out to you know, work with police and look and look around for Tracy some more. And the rest of the family stayed home just in case. Of course, if Tracy comes back, the dad walks into the house um, like an hour or so later. He looks incredibly distressed. He is crying. He something something is wrong. Younger sister said, did you find Tracy? Is she coming home? And the dad just responded with, Tracy is dead. Someone has killed her. Within a few blocks of their home, a neighbor was out walking her dog. And the dog kind of started to go towards something. And then the neighbor cautiously went towards the same thing. She thought what she saw was like a young woman sleeping in the grass. Um, they said that her like knees were kind of up, but she was curled. Um, it just looked like someone who was in like a natural like sleeping position almost. Maybe someone got super drunk or did drugs the night before and they just sort of passed out there on the grass. But as this person walked closer and closer, they realized that this person was not sleeping. This was a young woman who was deceased. She knew that because there were a pair of pantyhose tied very tightly around this young girl's neck and there was a stick on it so that they could basically, whoever did this would twist that stick in order to tighten the um, pantyhose to strangle this individual. It wouldn't take much longer for the police to identify the body as Tracy Ann Patient. She was just 13 years old. Police would quickly surmise that Tracy was dumped in this location. Um, they saw like marks in the ground that looked like she had been like, like rolled over there or just sort of like dragged down there. So the conclusion they came to was that Tracy must have been picked up by someone and likely in a car is where Tracy was killed and then she was dumped. Despite her pantyhose being off and around her neck, there was no actual signs of any kind of sexual assault that took place. There was no signs of anything along those lines. Police would question the friend um, that Tracy was with the night before. 
And she gave them a detailed account, like we walked to this certain street, and then at that point, it was about halfway, you know, like I normally do, I turned around and went home as Tracy walked towards her home. Pretty normal, something they did all the time, which the parents would all confirm. So everything from that point forward is just speculation. So again, police think that someone drove up next to her um, and they believe it's probably someone that knew Tracy or that Tracy knew this person well enough to get in the vehicle without any kind of altercation taking place because there were no witnesses who saw anything, who heard anything. Um, and this was a time of night when people were actually out walking their dogs. It was a nice evening. People, it was still relatively early, you know, it was like 9.30. So like people were out just doing casual walks um, and no one heard or saw anything abnormal. They believe that once in this car, the perpetrator tried to make some sort of inappropriate advances towards Tracy and Tracy then reacted and the perpetrator then reacted on their own and killed Tracy so that she wouldn't, you know, tell anyone. The parents would tell police that there was something missing from Tracy. It was her little signet ring that she always had on her, it was like this little silver signet ring. Um, but police even still, even though that was missing, police did not think this was like a robbery because this is still a very young girl. She's only 13 who robs a 13 year old expecting them to have anything of significant value on their person. Within a day or so, police got tips. They got a lot of phone calls um, with regards to saying that they think they saw Tracy get into a light brown colored van that was being driven by a man in a brown suit. This was observed by at least a couple of people. Um, also, witnesses came forward to say, it was like an elderly couple had come forward that they were out walking their dog um, and they had actually seen Tracy shortly after 9.30 p.m. walking on her own with no one else around her. Uh, so, and then the witnesses who say they saw Tracy get into this van say they saw it sometime before 10 p.m. So this all happened within like a 25 minute window. So sometime between 9.35 and 10 p.m. is when this all went down because then after the, the elderly couple walking their dogs, they moved on they didn't see anything untoward with Tracy and no one approached her. So it, it happened probably very soon after that. That being said, the, the, the case, it, it went cold. There was really no evidence left behind um, next to her body, on her body. There was just, they had nothing to go with. They were really hoping for more witness um, statements to come forward. About three months later, a man would come to police and he brought them a road map. The road map had Tracy's name written on it near where she was taken or found, I mean, um, and her name was circled on it. And that road map was found inside a van that the man who brought the map in had just purchased. Um, it was a, a light colored van and the map was sort of like crumpled up and thrown in the back. Unfortunately, the man who purchased the van did not get the individual's name who he purchased it from or like his contact information. Um, if he gave a description of the person, I don't, I can't seem to find that. Um, I'm assuming he did, but the van looked like it had been possibly painted um, as well. So, but police would look into the man who brought the map in because that seems a little suspicious they were able to confirm that this man was nowhere near where Tracy had disappeared or been taken or killed on that night. He was, his alibi was checked and he was completely cleared. About a year or so goes by. So now we're in November of 1978. Police still have really no significant leads on this case. And then they got a phone call in 1978. It was a man and he said this, listen, I am not going to give you my name or anything like that. I am not going to give you any information about myself, but I will give you information on the patient murder. But listen up, because I'm only gonna say it once. 
only once. The man then proceeded to tell the officer over the phone that you need to go look at a rubbish bin outside the Avondale shopping center. And in that rubbish bin, you're gonna find something of significance related to the patient case. The man also said, now you take this number down, 126040. Believe me, that has significance to this case. I will call you back on the 30th. The man never called back on the 30th. Police did go to the Avondale Shopping Center and they looked at the rubbish bins, trash bins, um, in outside of the entrance and lo and behold, they found something of significance. They found Tracy Ann Patient's silver signet ring which was taken off of her the night she was murdered. It didn't find any evidence on the ring, however. The only thing they had was just the ring itself. Now, I am to assume that police tried to track down this caller, and at this point, they kind of have to believe this may be the killer or someone who knows who the killer is, because the killer is the one who likely took the ring off of her body and then put it in this trash bin. So it, someone related to this was the caller. Police uh, searched and looked and read and they couldn't find any significance to you know um, the number 126040. The only thing they really came up with that is if you add up all of those numbers, they equal 13, which is Tracy's age. But like, why? Is, is the killer just toying with police? You know, they didn't know if this was some sort of cipher, a code. Uh, they had no idea. I mean, there's been speculation online that if you take the numbers and to the alphabet and blah, 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 and here's connections to uh, Hitler and connections to other things, and it's, it's people ran rampant with it. Um, more than likely, this number probably means nothing, and they were just trying to egg police on. They tried working under the theory that maybe Tracy was killed by a serial killer, because earlier in the 70s, kind of in the same area, there were a couple other murders of young girls, but the M.O. of Tracy's murder did not match the other two murders, which those two seemed to be connected. So they, they eventually ruled out that it was that person. Could it have been another serial killer? Possibly, but they still to this day don't know. And then it just went ice cold um, for, <laughs> for a very long time, for decades. 2010 rolls along and something kind of comes up. And this is where it gets kind of um, concerning along the lines of the police investigation itself. Like, I have questions. So, in 2010, an anonymous woman calls police and says that her neighbor's son, who was a 21-year-old man who had just been released from prison shortly before the Tracy Ann patient murder, he was the one to have murdered the young girl. She said she had been in the neighbor's house and she saw the silver signet ring just sitting on a counter um, and then she overheard the neighbor, the mother of the 21-year-old, essentially confess that her son was the one to kill Tracy. The neighbor, the, the one who was reporting this, said that the 21-year-old had a light-colored brown van who he had just cleaned shortly after the murder. He repainted it and then he sold it. This kind of matches up with witnesses who think they saw Tracy in a van with an unknown man. Same color van. So could it have been the van that the witness from way back when who had the map? Could it have been that van? Unfortunately, we don't know. Uh, because police apparently didn't take this tip very seriously. They said it wasn't credible. So, to my knowledge, and I cannot say this for a fact, but I, it does not seem that the police investigated this young man, who's probably now much, much older, um, 
because nothing ever came from it. There was no stories or updates on it. So I don't know if they investigated it and what were the results if they did. But you would think somewhere would be the information. The case goes back cold again. And by 2016, the uh, police station there in Auckland, New Zealand, they start a cold case unit. And the Tracy Ann patient case is one of the very first ones they bring, bring back out, they dust it off, and they look at it again. So then they go on the news saying, we've reopened the case. If anyone has any information, please come forward. And then they get a phone call pretty quickly. A man by the name of Gary Ross calls police in 2016. He told them on the phone that he had called just two days after the murder. He then called about a couple of months after that. And he called a couple of times over the years until he basically just gave up. But when he heard this was being reopened, he said, you know what? I'm going to give it one last shot. What Gary Ross says is that on the night of January 29th, 1976, sometime after 9.30 p.m., but probably before 10 p.m., he was driving down 295 Great North Road, which is actually the area where Tracy and uh, where Tracy had interacted with the older couple who was walking their dog. Gary Ross says he sees a man holding a young girl kind of by the shoulder and just leading her on. He did not like, he wasn't like gripping onto her. She did not look like she was in any kind of distress. She was not panicking. She was not resisting. She was going along with the man who was holding her by the shoulder. He says the man was middle-aged to possibly elderly and he was wearing a hat. Now, if he truly saw a middle-aged or elderly man, then that does not line up with the 21-year-old who had been called about earlier in 2010 about um, the one who says, you know, the neighbor and the 21-year-old and blah, blah, blah. So that description wouldn't match up with that. Gary Ross also made no mention of a van or any vehicle of that nature. So surely police looked into this. No, I, again, I can't find anywhere where they truly did a deep dive into this and looked into it. It sounds like they didn't take him credible either. We are now over 40 years later. Not one person has been named a suspect. Not one person has ever been put in handcuffs over this case. They claim they say they have about 850 persons of interests that they have interviewed over the decades, but none of them led to anything. Now, I feel that they were given several promising tips, several promising leads, but they just didn't, like, why didn't they go forward with them? Like, why didn't they really look into all these leads? And if they did, they did they're not telling the public um, but there's been at least a couple of promising ones. I mean, that the neighbor who said the 21 year old and they had the signet ring at the house and he had repainted his van and sold it. That lines up with other witness testimony about a person buying a repainted van with a crumpled map that had Tracy's name on it. Like that adds up, uh, you know, like do something. It, to me, it sounds like this killer likely knew Tracy um, just because, again, there was no altercation heard or seen. Um, so she may have very willingly gotten into a vehicle with this man that she felt comfortable enough with to get in their car. No one heard screaming. No one heard cries for help. No one saw, um, you know, a younger woman being accosted inside of a vehicle. Um nothing like that um so it's it's such a bizarre mystery this is a case where you think okay someone had to have seen something and people did i mean they didn't see anything uh crazy that they see people have come forward to say i've seen i saw the girl with a person or with a van no altercation but i, I at least saw someone and uh, it's to me it's frustrating that like, why didn't these people get thoroughly investigated? Like, why are they just brushing off these leads or being very flippant about them? But I, I don't have a conclusion for you. That's literally the end of the story. Um, there is no answers. Um, her case 
Her murder is still unsolved. This poor 13-year-old girl who was just minutes from her home was stolen uh, from her family and her friends and everyone. And it sounds like this poor family is just never going to get closure. And more importantly, who was the man who made the phone call? Who knew where the ring was? Like, that's the most baffling part. They couldn't find out where he was calling from? Like, anything? I mean, I get it. Maybe he was only on the phone for a short period of time. This is the 70s. Different technology. I get it. But it's like, that right there seems to be your most promising thing. The guy knew where her ring was, for Christ's sakes. And what was that number about? Like, is that was that just to throw police off? Was it relevant? Who knows? Do you know the relevance of that number? <sighs> Maybe someone out there watching this video knows. Who knows? But that is it for this case, folks. Um, hope you found it interesting, of course. If you want to see much shorter form true crime content from me, you can just head on over to TikTok, um, which is called Making a True Crimer as well. The, it will be in the description below. Um, I have well over 2,000 videos of just a whole bunch more cases. Um, if you want to recommend a case for me to cover, please go to my link tree, which is in the description below. Go to my Crimer -er case list. Scroll through that list. There's over 4,200 names. I know. If you want to search, just go to it on a computer and hit Control F, type in the name. Or if you're on a phone, um, click the little three dots at the top and then hit Find and Replace. Then type in the name. If the name does not come up at all, and by the way, the list is alphabetical for the most part. Um, but if the name doesn't come up at all, then send me an email to Mikey at TrueCrimerer.com also in the description below and just send me the name where it happened when it happened and then i can add it to my list once i see the email i get a lot of emails so just be patient with me responding to you and also please be extremely patient when it comes to me covering a case you recommend i pick the cases at random to be fair uh, because there are just so many names um, so I, I could cover it on the next video or i could cover it three months from now or a year from now so please be patient thank you if you want to be a Crimer or Crew member, <laughs> you can purchase this shirt through my merch store, also in the link tree in the description below. Uh, we sell other shirts um, with other sayings on it. We sell hoodies with the same sayings. Um, we sell, you can do it in rainbow font on some of the outfits or the shirts and sweaters. Um, we also sell wine glasses that you can now customize one of the words on it. We sell mugs and a beanie and little trinkets and stuff. So yeah, if you want to purchase some merch, go for it. It's in the description below. We're currently on Etsy, but I believe Adam, who makes my merch, his info is also below because he's wonderful. Um, he will be switching to a new shop soon. So when that happens, I'll let you guys know. But until the next case, true crimers, I shall see you for the next one. So ta-ta for now, true crime, a roofies. Whoa, nope, that's... <laughs> I'm being arrested.